Hello everyone, my name is Nabil Obeid. I'm a Chief Resident in General Surgery at New York University School of Medicine in New York City. And the title of this presentation is Applying to a Surgical Fellowship, which is intended for current general surgery residents who are interested in pursuing further training uh, in the form of a general surgery subspecialty fellowship. The presentation will focus mainly on the details of the application cycle and process as a whole, as well as how to make a good impression on your interview day. So let's start with the basics. Uh, there are multiple specialties that one can apply to after completing general surgery training. And these are done through different application services. Uh, for instance, the Fellowship Council and Electronic Residency Application Service, otherwise known as ERAS. Within the Fellowship Council, one can apply to an advanced gastrointestinal or minimally invasive uh, fellowship, as well as flexible endoscopy, bariatric surgery, hepatopancreatic biliary surgery, and non-ACGME colorectal and thoracic surgery. Within the ERAS application, one can apply to the colon and rectal surgery fellowship, complex general surgical oncology, as well as thoracic surgery, which is a December cycle. In terms of the advanced GI, MIS, endoscopy, and bariatric fellowships, each individual program will contain a variable representation of each of these in their overall fellowship experience. For instance, one program may be very heavy in bariatric surgery and will not have much endoscopic experience, whereas another program may be overall focused on advanced gastrointestinal surgery with a small portion of bariatric surgery and a small portion of endoscopy. It's up to the applicant to investigate each of these individual programs uh, by going to the Fellowship Council website, which has all of this information in order to determine whether or not the individual program is a good fit for the applicant. It's advisable that you keep an Excel spreadsheet of all of these details for each program as the details can get daunting and will help to keep you organized throughout the application cycle. The other thing to note is that the non-ACGME colorectal and thoracic surgery fellowships through the Fellowship Council are on a different uh, application cycle than the, the above mentioned uh, fellowship specialties. So be sure to keep this in mind. Both uh, Fellowship Council and ERAS websites are excellent resources and you can sort through individual programs based on multiple criteria, including whether or not the fellowship is considered an advanced GI versus a bariatric versus a flexible surgical and endoscopic fellowship, and also by geographic location, normally by state. These websites will also offer detailed information about the faculty that one will work with, as well as the case volume and variety, any affiliated hospitals that the fellow may be rotating through, and academic activity, as well as outpatient experience involved in the fellowship. The other basic information that you really need to know is the application cycle itself. And I've listed here an example of the 2015-16 application cycles for different subspecialties. In general, be cognizant of the fact that the majority of the application cycle, if not the entirety of it, will occur during the fourth year of your general surgery residency. And you will match, in some cases, about a year in advance of the start of your fellowship. For instance, with the Fellowship Council, for an advanced GI MIS bariatric and or endoscopic fellowship, the application opened December of 2014, and the deadline was several months later in mid-February. The rank order list, which is the list of the programs in your uh, preferential order, was due at the end of May of 2015, and match day followed this by several weeks on June 16th, 2015. 
the fellowship for that cycle would not start until August of 2016, and therefore the applicant would have the entire fifth year of their residency having already matched into their future fellowship. For the non-ACGME colon and rectal as well as thoracic fellowships, you can see the cycle is a little bit uh, off cycle in that match day was in January of 2016 for a fellowship start of August 2016. In terms of the ERAS fellowship applications, the colon and rectal surgery cycle is a little bit abbreviated in that the application starts in July of 2016, match day is in November, and the fellowship begins the following August. Finally, as you see here, the surgical oncology timeline is such that the rank order list is due in June, and the match day is two weeks after that, with the fellowship beginning the following August. With these things in mind, you really want to try to plan ahead in terms of your general surgery rotation schedule. For instance, if you're not exactly sure what type of fellowship you may want to do, you'll try to line up several different types of surgery rotations in order to get that broad exposure. You'll want to work with either classmates or administrators, whoever is making your schedule of rotations, to try to get your respective fellowship discipline rotations early on in your fourth year in order for you to interact in a meaningful way and spend enough time with specific faculty members and mentors in that discipline. This will also set you up well to obtain great letters of recommendation as you'll have spent quite a bit of time with these future letter writers and they will have gotten to know you quite well both in and out of the operating room. In terms of specific application requirements, in general you'll need to submit letters of recommendation, write a personal statement, submit a CV, and provide a photo. For letters of recommendation, Fellowship Council and ERAS may have a different set of limits, but in general up to five letters. And this is a very important portion of your application. So you wanna think and plan ahead in terms of who will be your letter writers as they carry a great deal of weight. The bottom line is you definitely want someone to write a letter who knows you well and can speak to that effect and will not just be a generic letter of recommendation that rehashes your CV. If you've done any research time, it's a good idea to ask your research mentor or PI to be one of those letter writers because the chances are that individual knows you well as a person, your personality, as well as your work ethic. Some programs or application services will require letters from a program director, department chair, division chief. So again, a lot of details to keep track of, but you need to stay organized and on top of these. The other thing is that you do need to provide your letter writers with enough upfront notice. So don't wait until, you know, the month before the application is due to ask them to write your letter. In terms of your personal statement, Focus on the strengths of your application, specify and really explain why you chose the specialty that you are applying to, and importantly, make sure that some of the people that you respect and look up to and have been through the process before have a look at your personal statement, both for grammar and for content and style. Your CV should be organized and easy to read, and it's much easier to keep it current and updated throughout residency rather than having to wait until the application time to try to think back as to what to add to your CV. If you've done a significant amount of research, you should keep separate sections for your publications, oral presentations, posters, and book chapters in order to highlight the effort and the results of your work. And finally, for the photo, you'll want to make sure it's a high-quality professional picture that you're wearing professional, proper attire. One thing to note is that many conferences or national meetings will have a professional photographer at a booth in the exhibit hall, so you should look out for these. It's a great opportunity to get that professional photo. 
So moving on to the actual interview process, once you've submitted your application, you will get interview invitations, which are usually in the form of an email. You want to make sure that you stay on top of your email inbox, make sure you're not missing any of the invitations, and occasionally they will show up in your spam or junk folder. If you continue to have issues with your inbox, I would recommend checking with your institution's uh, IT department to resolve these issues. The program will generally provide one or more dates for the interview day, and it's a great idea to keep a calendar specifically for your interview offers in order to stay organized and to try to maximize the number of interviews that you can actually go on. If you do have a conflict with one of the interview dates and there's no other way to resolve the conflict, then I do suggest that you contact the program. You can email the program coordinator and sometimes they can be flexible. It is certainly on an individual basis and it's not a guarantee, but it's worth a try. And sometimes they can either provide another date or plan to conduct an interview at one of the national meetings such as SAGE's. You'll also want to coordinate with your own residency in terms of coordinating with classmates or other residents who may have to cover your clinical duties while you're away. And finally, in terms of the number of programs that you apply to, interview, and rank, this will vary and depends on the competitiveness of the specialty that you're applying to, the strength of your application, any financial considerations. You can take out a small loan to help pay for these expenses and also any time away from your residency clinical duties as some programs may have restrictions on this. Before your interview, make sure to check the program website as well as the program information on the Fellowship Council or ERAS websites. Make sure to take notes and again you can use an Excel spreadsheet to stay organized. Specifically, you should take notes on the structure of the Fellowship who are the faculty, how many faculty, what the case mix is, and what are the affiliated institutions that you may be rotating at. You'll also want to prepare questions to ask the interviewer. Remember, the interview itself is a two-way street, and you will have the opportunity to ask questions of your own. It's a good idea to have questions prepared in your mind or on a piece of paper. Uh, in advance so that you seem prepared, that you're interested in the program, and that you get answers to all your questions. I've listed here a link to the Fellowship Council PDF that contains a list of very good questions that one can ask on the interview day. And finally, one last thing to keep in mind, which may be a little bit of an unknown to most applicants, is that societies such as SAGES, ASMBS, have specific certification requirements. For instance, for ASMBS, you have to meet a certain number of stapled anastomotic procedures in order to be certified with ASMBS. And this is something that you should ask and inquire about during the interview day, both with the fellows who can provide you with their case logs, as well as with the program directors in order to determine whether or not the individual program meets those society certification requirements. So for the actual interview day, I highly recommend interacting with the current fellows because they are a great resource for you. They can answer a lot of your questions, provide you with a lot of information, and you should really try to think of them as a product of the fellowship program. Something that probably goes without saying and is true of any interview is that you should be courteous and polite to everyone you meet throughout the interview day, no matter who they are or what their job entails. First impressions are important. Obviously, you need to be on time, be polite, confident, and make eye contact with those that you speak with. Be energetic and passionate, but don't come off as overly confident or arrogant. A big no-no is asking about time off or vacation. While those things may be important, the interview day is not the time to inquire about those things. Finally, you'll want to dress appropriately, limit the perfumes and colognes that you use, make sure your suit is clean, and try avoiding anything flashy or eyebrow raising. 
For the actual conversation of your interview with the faculty and or fellow, be sure to know your application well. The interviewer has the right to ask any questions about information in your file. Importantly, if you've done research, make sure to know the details of your research, be able to articulate your project, what the goals, the hypothesis was, what the findings were, and what the conclusions are. They're likely to ask about why you chose the specialty that you did and what your career goals might be, so make sure you've prepared uh, answers for those questions. Finally, don't lie about your interest in the program. Do not relay anything specific in terms of the order of your rank of the program at the time of the interview. Make sure to take notes throughout the interview day, especially on things like who and how many faculty will you be working with, what the case volume and distribution will be like, as well as what the involvement of the fellow in the operating room will be, what research opportunities and databases might be available, what your outpatient experience and responsibilities are, as well as any protected academic time you might have. After all of your interviews are over, you'll want to reflect on the overall process as well as each individual program. Any missing information or gaps need to be clarified and you can contact the fellows or program coordinators for that missing information. Reflect on the notes that you've taken during the interview day for each of the programs, start to compare them to one another, and write down pros and cons of each. Certainly thank yous are a good idea and emails are more than appropriate. And at this point you'll want to seek guidance in terms of your top programs of choice. Speak with your mentors, maybe those that have written letters of recommendation for you, your program director or chairman if they are familiar with the field. Those people may know faculty or details of the program that were missed during the interview day. And finally, you'll want to reflect on your own personal goals. Remember, you need to do what's best for you and or your family, not what others may want for you. It's a good idea to review your impressions of the programs and what you might be feeling at this stage of the cycle with your spouse, family, or friends, because certainly their opinion matters, but more importantly, it may end up influencing how you rank your programs in the end. So now you've come to the actual match process, which is where you rank each of the programs that you've interviewed at from your top choice to your least ideal preference. The biggest advice I can give when you start to make your rank order list is not to try to play a mind game where you guess what programs might be more or less interested in you and rank according to that. You really just want to rank programs honestly and truthfully according to what your real genuine preferences are for attending specific fellowship programs. The program that is most desirable to you should be ranked number one, regardless of what your perceptions are of your chances of matching with that program. Another important point is to not rank a program if you would rather not match at all than attend that program. Again, when creating your rank order list, make sure to consider personal, family, or geographic restrictions you may have. And trust your gut. The overall impression of the interview day at a particular program carries a lot of weight. Also, reflect back on your discussions with the fellows of the programs as well as your own mentors. Rank enough places, especially if limited geographically. This number is going to be different for each person and it's going to be based on your competitiveness, any limitations you may have, and there's no magic number. But it's a good idea to run this by your mentor to make sure that you're applying to enough places. And finally, once you've finalized your rank order list, Go all in in terms of asking your mentors to make phone calls to the top program on your list. Those gestures go a long way and carry a lot of weight, especially if they have a relationship with the program faculty or program director. Just so everyone can get a sense of the match data, I've listed here the data from the Fellowship Council website for the 2015 application cycle for the Advanced GI, MIS, Bariatric, Endoscopy Fellowships. As you can see, the data is 
sorted by program statistics and applicant statistics. For programs, 97% of programs were filled and 95% of all positions were filled. On the applicant side though, only 63% of applicants successfully matched into a fellowship. Obviously this varied as you can see based on the geographic location of the residency training, uh, but 37% of applicants did not match in 2015. These numbers are important just to keep in mind as you go through the application cycle and to make sure that you're maximizing your chances for matching. So what happens if you don't match? First, don't be discouraged. You need to stay persistent and dedicated to your ultimate goal of matching to a fellowship because there are options. In general, the match system will notify applicants of whether or not they have successfully matched or not in advance of actual match day. Therefore, an applicant will know if they have not matched and they can enter what's called the scramble process in order to try to successfully find a program that is also unfilled in order to match successfully. During this time, it's a good idea to talk to your mentors, program director, and others at your institution that may know of positions outside the match. If you don't match when everything is said and done, it's important to be honest with yourself about the deficiencies in your application. Spend some time reflecting on what the weaknesses may have been. If it was due to lack of research participation or productivity, make sure you spend some time fixing those things. You may want to wait till after you pass your general surgery board exams in order to provide another set of credentials uh, to your resume. And lastly, another great idea is to become more involved in your specialty societies. It's a great way of showing your dedication and passion for the field that you've chosen, but also to form special relationships uh, and interact with leaders in the field. And these relationships may pay off in the future. I want to thank you all for listening. That concludes this presentation, and I hope uh, it provides you with some insight into what to expect with the application cycle and maybe how to maximize your chances of being successful with the fellowship match. Thank you very much.